Hello and welcome to another edition of the Moving Iron Podcast. This podcast is proudly provided by Axon, helping dealers move more iron for almost 100 years. Find out more at axontire.com. Axon was started almost 100 years ago out of a passion for keeping agriculture moving. It's that same passion that drives them today. With a vision for a better experience for both farmer and dealer, they set out to create a better way to move more iron. When you partner with Axon, you get immediate access to a full range of products and solutions designed to meet the complex needs of today's grower. Axon carries all major brands and sizes of tires, wheels, and tracks. From custom colors and sizes to fully customized wheels, you can have the solution for virtually any problem today's farmer is trying to solve. To find more or become an Axon dealer, please visit axontire.com. Moving iron in the 21st century. Hard working people working hard for you and me. Moving iron time and time again. Through the years you'll find us here. Moving iron. Hello and welcome to Moving Iron Podcast Markets with Sean Hackett. This edition of the Moving Iron Podcast is brought to you by Axon, helping dealers move more iron for almost 100 years. Find out more at axontire.com. And also Tractor Zoom delivering insights. If you are in the business of the equipment world or you have a piece of equipment and you want to see what's going on in the auction marketplace, what the inventories look like that are coming down the pike, what some trend lines might be developing, all that fun stuff that comes along with with no understanding and knowing what's going on in the equipment marketplace, you've got to get yourself an Iron Comps subscription. You might think to yourself, where am I going to get an Iron Comps, Iron Comps subscription at? Well, go over to ironcomps.com and check that out. If you get your subscription to ironcomps.com and you decide to go with that route, use Moving Iron at checkout and you get yourself a nice little discount. Sean Hackett is with Hackett Financial, and he is out of Boca Raton, Florida. And Sean is gracious enough to come on to, to the podcast once a week and talk about what's going on. And uh, Sean, it's been uh, about eight days or so since uh, Joe Biden's took him president, and there's a lot of a lot of things he signed, a lot of executive orders he signed when it came to Excel pipelines and stuff like that. And and when he when I saw that news come out, I had a, just a couple thoughts kind of come to mind and. And I thought this would be a great topic for us to talk about. So if you go back in time a couple of years, there was a, uh, a pretty good issue about getting crops from the various storage locations um, across the United States and Canada uh, to different ports and different shipping areas due to the amount of oil that was getting shipped via, via rail. And um, I guess as you take a look at that, Sean, what are your thoughts about moving forward in this year and i know this this keystone pipeline situation is supposed to be a 60-day deal but it, who knows how long it'll it'll actually end up being but as you take a look at these these situations that are coming up in this kind of um historic situation that we're seeing with with some potential big weather problems coming up to me i get i guess i look and see that there's probably a situation where basis is going to be an issue just the the amount of heating oil and gasoline and crude oil and those kind of things getting moved around. And then also, as you take a look at just moving corn, soybeans, wheat, those kind of things, it's different various sports where, where the rail system is a major part of that. There could be a, a, a bigger problem coming our way. So what are your thoughts on that? And or am I just overreacting here a little bit? I don't think you're overreacting. I mean, just look what's going on with the container shortage around the world, right? right. Uh, where there's, you know, Rates have gone up 300, 600% because there's not enough uh, available containers to ship everything. Um, that's a microcosm of a global problem. But domestically, if you have to spend so much of your rail moving uh, oil around um, and it, 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 it takes up the place of where grain would be moving or where uh, natural gas would be moving or propane would be moving, uh, heating oil would be moving, all that sort of thing, you, you, you run yourself into a bottleneck. And if you throw that onto that a historic, long, very, very cold winter where demand for energy is going to be at a record high, so the demand for the product is going to be the highest we've seen in anyone's memory, you have yourself set up for an energy crisis without a question, meaning not everybody who, who's, who needs the supply of energy is going to get it. And unfortunately, the humanitarian consequences for that 
KC are not very good. You know, I mean, there's going to be um, a lot of problems with um, with that. You know, and people are going to, especially the elderly, are going to be um, very vulnerable. You know, to uh, to having a bad outcome. I don't want to, you know, be a gloom and doomer, but this is not a good situation. We're we are we are we are taxing our infrastructure, which was already on the brink as it was at a time that we're moving into a record demand period for energy when, uh, when, when, when rail is going to be even in higher demand. So it's really a perfect store for setting up a, a colossal energy crisis on our hands. And, um, you know, I mean, Biden's doing exactly what he said he was going to do. I mean, he said, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do everything I can to make fossil fuel hard to get and hard and, and, and reduce investment in it. And part of that is the, the pipeline and he'll be doing a lot more things to make it harder to invest. So, um, we've been used to the minute prices go up for crude or natural gas that the supply comes rushing in and the investment comes rushing in. We may find that under a Biden administration that the supply is much more sticky to come back online unless we really, really get a, 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 a crisis that, that demands access to fossil fuel. You know, where the people say we demand this or else, you know, uh, the midterm elections aren't going to go well, if you know what I'm trying to say, you know? Right. Yeah. Um, yep. Yep. So it's a big problem. And, I, and I've been worrying about this time for a long time, Casey, this, this winter coming up for 21, 22, I've been really worried about it. And obviously having a Biden administration with their policies is only going to take what was already going to be a difficult situation uh, and make it even worse. So if you're, if you're in the business of using a lot of energy, using a lot of propane, using a lot of natural gas, using a lot of energy of any form, I would encourage you to lock that physical supply in uh, as much as you possibly can through next winter. Um, there's going to be a point where the basis could get so wide that, that literally the supply is not available for everybody. And, and it may be so uneconomical for you to purchase it there that you have to think ahead. And right now prices still aren't too bad, but they could, they could turn very, very quickly. And I would rather be early than, than, than be too late on this one. So, yep. Yeah, and that's that's kind of exactly what I was I was thinking about too. Is just it's the the basis that we saw in corn a couple of years ago and wheat and those kind of things where you know basis was a dollar dollar twenty five dollar fifty. I mean, we saw a lot of that all that basis take hold and, and really run. And also the the propane shortage that we had was not so much there was a lack of propane as much as there was a lack of ability to get it moved around. And I think that's the that's the issue I kind of see coming right now. So there's uh, definitely something to pay attention to here through the rest of the year. Let's let's talk about this a little bit. Last week we saw soybeans lose almost a dollar and some change, whatever it was, dollar and twenty off of what off the highs. Uh, and then this week they've come surging back. So there's that volatility that that you've been talking about pretty regular on here. Uh, that that big big huge swings in the marketplace. So you know we had a big sell off last week. Things have kind of rallied back to about half of what they were. Uh, last week or so in that general vicinity talk about that a little bit a little bit what you see happening there or we're gonna these thrashing markets are something we're going to be have to get used to they're here to stay when you get this kind of heightened alert of supply concerns supply shortages weather volatility currency volatility government policy volatility you're going to have wild wild swings um, like we just saw, you know, we had crashing markets late last week. Then China comes in, does a flash purchase of corn, rocks the market back up. You know, this is, you know, this is going to be a, an ongoing feature. It's important, however, to remember that um, through all the volatility, the trend is going to be, in our view, up. I mean, we're going to be trending higher um, through this volatility. So we want everyone to who's on the buy side of these markets that needs to buy cash, grain, cash of any sort, you know, to utilize these big swings to the downside to get more coverage. Use every break you get to buy more coverage, get more coverage, lengthen your coverage. When you look at corn prices, December 21, uh, you know, at a, at a significant discount to corn, you look at December 22, only at 405 or 410, you know, there's still very, very economical corn prices you know, in the new crop and the new, new crop to take advantage of those prices, take advantage of any break for the old crop that you need. This market is, um, we are set up for, uh, you know, 
for some pretty wild uh, prices to be seen going forward. We don't believe we're, anywhere, we're close to seeing our peak prices. And if you've missed a good part of this August move, if you've been, if you've been chasing your tail, you know, try to look for these breaks. We'll get more of them. Last week is not the last time we're going to see a big break in these markets. We're going to get a lot of these. Uh, don't believe the bears say, oh, top's in, bear market. We're not going back to a bear market. We're not going back to the eight years of a bear. In our view, we're in a more of a, of a uptrending market with heightened volatility, which is good for sellers who need to sell and it's good for buyers who need to buy. But have no illusions of grandeur. The, 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 the rules of engagement have changed. And if you don't change with them, you're going to continue to find yourself on the wrong side of the market here. So, yep. Okay, so the next thing I want to talk about was there was this, we had this uh, weather event down in South America, some key areas of growing areas got got some rain. Um, not every place did, but uh, a majority of the place did. And when they use the word easing the drought situation, that tells me that there's still a drought situation to be concerned about um, and that there, there were, there's more lip service there than there was anything else. What's your thoughts on that? <clears throat> well, I mean, anytime you get a good battle rain, like especially Argentina for sure, and Southern Brazil, uh, soybean has got a good batch of rain. It doesn't mean it reverses all that preceded it. It doesn't mean all who are going to have a record crop, record yields. It, it means that the worst case scenario that could have been the case now is probably not likely, meaning a catastrophe. Right. So the catastrophe right. potential is off the table. I would I would believe certainly for Argentina, certainly for southern Brazil, the catastrophe potential now is probably not possible. The rains they've gotten have been enough that it, it, it moves the crop far enough during a critical period of pod setting uh, that that you, you've you've reduced the worst case scenario. But it doesn't mean that it's a great crop. It's a record crop. It just means that you've removed the worst case scenario. And for those that might have been trading the worst case scenario, you know, they violently sold the market late last week. Okay. Um, so, so, so it has, it, that's the impact, but it doesn't mean we're going to have great crops. It still means we're going to have crops much lower. And of course, weather is still a factor. I mean, we haven't made the crop yet. We still have weather for February that for soybeans is still very, very important to determine can it still get a little bit better or can it still get a little bit worse from here? But on the margin, we've broken the back of the worst case scenario. To me, that's the quintessential important takeaway. That is no longer really a likely possibility. And that probably means that unless China keeps rushing in and buying, and maybe they do that, from a weather perspective, I don't think we can take soybeans specifically to new highs based upon weather alone. Yeah. Yeah. So let's bounce over and look at the Black Sea regions. They've had, um, I read an article earlier this week about Ukraine raising their um, projected corn crop a little bit, but they're still now. Then the very next sentence is we're in a middle of a, of an epic drought. We're worried about our wheat crop, which we've talked about here. Ag Agnosium is with what's going on in Ukraine, Russia, and that area and the whole black sea region. Putin did go ahead with the export tax, like, like they talked about, but they kind of eased it a little bit. Talk about that a little bit. What you see happening there with wheat. Well, first of all, <laughs> there's no way you could project a, a winter wheat crop until you know what happens with springtime weather when they come out of dormancy. Anyone that right. thinks they could predict the crop without knowing that spring weather, it's just a wild guess. You know I mean? So I, I personally believe that one of the big problems with uh, Russia is, is that they're worried about very, very domestic, high domestic prices. Their people are yelling and screaming that they're paying a lot of money for food as the food inflation has been taking off. So, a lot of the reason that the tariffs were put on was to keep more of the supply in house to try to keep the prices down. And because we're so concerned about the next crop coming up, part of keeping prices down is to say, well, we think things are looking better than they did. We're, we're all more optimistic. You know, no one could say the right or wrong, Casey. They could say anything they want this time of the year. They may be right. They may be wrong, but no one can say that they're not, that any estimate right now is a possibility because we haven't gotten through spring weather yet. Right. But it's their best interest to say things are looking better so it keeps the domestic price down because that's the bigger problem right now is food inflation at home and the, you know, the, uh, the people starting to get angst. So I look at all that. I just 
look at it as much more of a political uh, kind of a maneuver than anything that was really changed with the crop. You're not going to overturn the drought that took place when the crop went into dormancy, the lack of stands that took place. None of that's going to change by, uh, by getting a little snowfall here and a little, a little moisture. Uh, it's only going to change if they have a really, really conducive um, and impactfully positive spring season can, can they turn around, but, but only on that, on the crop that has already been established, it's already been established from ag- ag- uh, agronomy work that Russia's crop about 15 to 20% actually never, never, never came out of the ground, never actually got going. It's, it's, it's gone. So you no matter how, what kind of weather you get the rest of the way, that is not going to come back. So, right. So remember, we, we, you know, don't do what people say, <laughs> do what they do. And what, are they, and what is Russia pretty much doing? They want to export as little as possible because they're worried about their supplies. Uh, all that's happened, but think about this, the mentality. If you're an exporter of wheat, and here's this deadline coming up on February, what is it, 15th, you know, that these tariffs are going to kick in. They're trying to get as much wheat out of the country as possible right now so that they can sell it to as many people as possible right now so they don't get caught with the tariff. So short term, it actually is a bearish feature to wheat prices because it forces extra exports onto the market than would otherwise be the case as exports front run this uh, tariff. Once you get to the tariff, though, exports are done. And so we would view any correction in winter wheat that might come from this extra supply being exported into the marketplace as an opportunity if you're on a cash buyer side of the wheat, of the winter wheat market. So, yep. Yep. Okay. So last thing here, Sean, we'll, we'll wrap it up for today. I've read several articles about uh, a new strain of African swine fever that they've, they've spotted in China and that has uh, put some more pressure on, on the uh, Chinese pork market. Um, what are your thoughts about that? And is it just going to be more you know, status quo for the Chinese as far as importing pork from around the world? Or, or do you think that this is more of a, they're in a decent enough spot now where they can kind of control what's going on? Well, if, if you think what really happened over the last three years, Casey, they went from backyard operations to corporate uh, hog farms, right? So right. the fact that, that we're really dealing with primarily all this new production, all this hog rebuilding is occurring at these corporate large farms that can control uh, their, 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 you know, outside conditions and can handle things much better and eradicate things much better. I don't really believe that this is going to be the issue that it was three years ago when you had half the production in a guy that had five pigs out in the back that he fed scraps from the table. You know, we really are not dealing with that anymore. We're dealing with big corporate farms that have a vested interest in containing everything within a controllable unit. So I, you know, on the margin, I, I don't believe that that's going to have the same impact. I think they've got their hands around it by shifting who's making all the, who's producing all the hogs now. And so um, short term, it can always cause some music reactions, but I don't believe this is going to be a, a market impacting event in 2021. So right on. well, good stuff as usual, Sean, if folks want to reach out to you and get more information about Hackett financial and what they can do for their operation, what's the best way to do that? Our website is Hackett, H A C K E T T advisors.com lots of information on there that they can take a look at to see if what we do might be of value to their operations right on sean i'm casey seymour with moving iron podcast make sure you check me out on facebook twitter and instagram that's where you're going to find the latest editions of the moving iron my podcast as well as any blogs i have posted go to moving iron llc.com if you want to check out and see what sean looks like get a little more information about him check out the moving iron podcast webpage and go to moving iron podcast and look down at market contributors and you'll see sean there and i uh, have a nice little bio about who he is and how to get a hold of him and those kind of fun things too so With that, I am Casey Seymour, Sean Hackett. Let's come with some iron, folks. Out. You want to have a meaningful, competitive advantage to help sell more equipment. Whether you represent the sales, parts, or management department of an implement dealership, there's a surprising amount of complexity when it comes to tire, wheel, and track technology. Let Axon worry about that so you can get back to supporting your customers. Axon has leveraged years of experience to create a streamlined process that gives you a proven path to help today's grower and sell more equipment. The roots of their organization go back almost 100 years to the invention of the rubber tractor tire. Supporting agriculture is the number one driver of Axon from product development through sales and service. To find more or become an Axon dealer, head over to axontire.com. Moving iron.
in the 21st century. Hardworking people working hard for you and me. Moving higher, time and time again. Through the years, you'll find us here. 